Coming to you live from my apartment, it's Rob has a podcast, and now here's a guy who's ready to wrap it up. We're going to talk about some probabilities today of how likely are things to happen on Survivor. One last Survivor off-season podcast before we kick off the Survivor season this Wednesday night with the premiere of Survivor San Juan del Sur. And here is one of our top guests here on Rob has a podcast, a man who is making, I believe, his third appearance on the podcast here to talk about his summer research project. He did something very nerdy this summer. Here he is, poker superstar, Jason Somerville. Jason, how are you? Wow, that was probably the nicest thing that's ever been said about me. So many I nice doubt things it. in there. I doubt it. By the way, I, I really like that now that you are usually the only one that has a bell, but you know, Rob, how are you? Oh, you have a, <laughs> a, a deeper bell. You have a yeah, deeper. I, we can do like, a, like a, a bell choir maybe later this holiday season. Stay Maybe if we that. if we need to play Family Feud, we could uh, buzz in. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, I uh, you know I'm an inquisitive fella, but not really like the hardworking kind of inquisitive fella. So I uh, I have this friend David Williams, who uh, not the poker player David Williams, but he is a bit of a statistics genius. And uh, I had some survivor questions, and I did a bit of uh, research and couldn't really find a lot of the answers to some of the questions that I had. So David, who wasn't a survivor guy at all, I was like, hey David, why don't you do a, a deep dive for us here and answer some of these questions. And so I gave him like three or four questions and uh, he came back to me with 21 uh, survivor questions that he did research on. He actually went back and watched almost like all of your survivor podcasts ever, Rob. Did you know that? No, yeah. I didn't know that that was part of it, to go no, back and... Went back. He, there are there are questions in here that he specifically heard you ask people hypothetically, and he said, "You know what? I'm gonna answer that." How's that for some go-getter, you know, attitude right there? That's very good because a couple of them I said, "Yeah, we we were just talking." about that. That was a good question to ask. That's right. Isn't that nice? David's the best. So I'm kind of like uh, like a patron of the arts, uh, an executive producer of all this stuff. So uh, if you guys want to see more of the breakdown of how this stuff has actually been built, the methodology that David used, we're going to post this whole document. Uh, on, it'll be on my Twitter. I think, Rob, you're going to post it too. And so you guys can take a look at all this data yourselves uh, once we're done with this, uh, this podcast. So yeah. how cool I'll is that? That's, it's awesome. I'll post the link on robinswebsite.com uh, in the show notes. I, I printed it out right here. Uh, cool. It's a it's a 33 page uh, document complete with you know uh, uh, Excel sheets and and all sorts of stuff. That's uh, right. Yeah, I'm out of toner and paper now after this. After <laughs> yeah, I can't even staple it. I've got to put a uh, a binder clip on it. How crazy is that? It, that, yes. is, that is crazy. So very excited to uh, get into all of this with you. 21 different questions we're going to talk about here uh, That's on right. the show. But before we get into Survivor, so uh, what's been going on with you? The last we talked to you, you uh, went out and won a uh, million dollars plus, and you didn't have to go on Survivor to do it. <laughs> so That's that right. Much more convenient. So uh, how's, yeah. been, how's the rest of the summer been for you? My summer has been awesome. I uh, I finished the World Series of Poker in the middle of July. Obviously, had my best uh, my best win ever. I managed to uh, to get fourth, or I guess actually we chopped a hundred thousand dollar buy-in tournament for one point three million dollars. No big deal. That was July, and then uh, took like two weeks off, and then got back to my show doing uh, Run It Up, which you can see the lovely set here. Uh, I've been trying to spin up fifty dollars to ten thousand. You know, my Run It Up challenge that I. I've been doing for, uh, I started doing it last year, picked it up again this year. We're actually midway through my season. I'm doing 50 episodes, Rob, every single day. I always said, wow. you're the man with the work ethic. I've tried to be more like you this season. Every day, new stuff, Rob. It's craziness. Yeah. Well, I don't know about, I could turn $50 into $0 pretty quickly. <laughs> that, that I could do. Yeah, you got that You got that down. Well, if you want to try my way, you can come run it up with me. So, yeah, that's what we've been doing. I've been doing new episodes. We started posting them end of August. We're 27 episodes in or it's, uh, 23 episodes in now, I guess, at this point. It's crazy. Nuts, nuts time over here. Well, you do a fantastic job. I mean, that somebody, and I think why why you have so much success is that some somebody like yourself who is as talented at, at playing poker as you are could just sit there and, and just play all the time. But the fact that you take the time to be a uh you know a, a you know a podcaster, a YouTuber, and do all of these things, I think that's what makes you really special in your field. 
Well, I like uh, I like doing what I want to do, and I just have always had a passion for you know like storytelling. Actually, right? You know, we like to talk with like our pear. hands on Long Island too. That's why I'm so excited to finally make it to video status with you, Rob. This is our first time on video together, so I'm really excited. I feel like this is going to be a whole nother level of communication. I'm very excited about. Yeah. Well, <laughs> very very exciting stuff. By the way, um, Jason, are you a Lost fan? I'm an enormous Lost fan. I just rewatched all, all every Lost episode I rewatched in August. So you know, Josh started his Lost. Re I watched the first one, and by the time it got to the end of the recap, I was like, okay, I don't even remember half the things he's talking about. Favorite episode, this and that. I don't even remember. So I wanted to go back and rewatch the whole thing. And now I just finished like a maybe a week or two ago, and now I'm excited to actually go watch the recap. So you can thank Josh for burning however many hours of my life that he burned in August. Yes, well, happy 10-year anniversary of Lost to you, yeah. and I know that this is probably going to be up your alley tonight, I believe at 8 p.m. Eastern on Post Show Recaps, Josh Wiggler is hosting the 10-year roundtable of oh. Lost, the 10-year anniversary is today, so uh, check that out on postshowrecaps.com, it's going to be a very fun show, and if you missed it, uh, check it out in the archives. All right, let's... Let's jump into this because uh, this is gonna. This is a lot to unpack here. Yeah. So how do you want to do this? Do you want me to give you the question and then uh, you t take us through the answers? So so I actually uh, I've actually spent the last uh, few hours and yesterday too kind of sorting out these to be kind of more logical because David just kind of did them by section. So I actually think that uh, if it's okay with you, we'll kind of like I'll get to play tour guide and you can just kind of relax. I'll ask you some questions. Oh. You know, you get. To be the expert, and I'll just uh, walk us through. How about that? Okay, fantastic. And so uh, this is one last great setup here for the Survivor season to kick off. Of course, Wednesday night is the 90-minute premiere of Survivor San Juan del Sur. We will be live with Survivor Know-It-Alls this Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. And then I will also speak with the first person kicked off of Survivor San Juan del Sur uh, this Thursday morning. So make sure you're locked in and subscribe to the podcast at robinswebsite.com slash iTunes, or uh, click the podcast tab for all the different ways to subscribe to the show. So it's going to be a huge fall here. Nice. That's so exciting. I can't wait. Very exciting. We're just gonna, we've got like a big present we're ready to unwrap. That's right. Is, uh, is Fishbach on for, uh, for Wednesday? Thur Thursday night. Thursday, oh, Thursday night. Yeah. Big Brother finale is on Wednesday, so we got to just gotcha. move our coverage back one day. Right, right. Gotcha. Sounds good. He's ready all to right, go. I'm all ready right. if you are. Tour guide, take, take us away. <laughs> Let's do some statistics here. All right, so the the core questions that I started out here with David were actually about the challenges. So I thought that would be a good place to get started out here today. So the the right off the top, let's talk about who have been the winningest challenge players on Survivor. So uh, I set David out and said, all right, let's look at so who are the biggest winners in Survivor history. And so we ranked them based on how many challenges that each player won. So for, for this question, we took out team-based competitions because we really couldn't identify it. We wanted to know individual win rates for this. So we took out the team stuff, and Redemption Island obviously has a... a uh, before we start here, I think it's important to say that this is going to be a very spoiler-heavy podcast. If you guys haven't seen all of the Survivor episodes, you know we're going to obviously be talking about everything from Survivor history. So you know, be aware, be aware of that. So I guess now that the yes. spoiler alert yes. has been issued, so including including Redemption Island, Rob, who do you think is the winningest Survivor challenge player ever? Well, I, I have my the, I have the document open. I'm oh, <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's pretty easy actually to say that Ozzy, including Redemption Island, uh, was the winningest player with 15 challenge wins. Second to him was Boston Rob, which also made sense to me. And then there's kind of a glut after that. But Ozzy had the most with 15. Redemption Island obviously it impacts a lot. You know, he must have won six Redemption Island challenges back in mm -hmm. uh, what's what season was that that he opted to go to Redemption Island? Uh, it was, I believe, Survivor South Pacific. Nice. I don't know if that's true, but I believe you're going to be right about these a lot more yes. than I am. We're going to test your trivia because there's going to be a lot of small things today. Uh, so, so yeah, Ozzy ended up as number one. Uh, Ozzy is number one because he's won the six Redemption Island duels. Uh, Matthew Elrod, who the guy was, who he won eight Redemption Island challenges in a row, didn't get uh, farther than that. But if remember that same season, he had eight challenge wins all at Redemption Island, which was interesting, and that actually puts him in a tie for sixth. I thought was interesting. Without Redemption Island, 
Boston Rob is, is number one. But what we wanted to look at was not just who won the most challenges, but when given the opportunity to participate in a challenge, how are people competed, right? Because if you let's say you've done 50 challenges and you've won 10, surely that win rate is not as, as, as you know, uh, important or interesting as if you only did 10 and you won 10, right? So we looked at uh, uh, this differential for the most part, and even with that, uh, Ozzy still ends up at uh, the number one spot. Uh, he's, been, he's competed in so many challenges that his 15 challenge wins, he's actually won nine more challenges than would be expected by an average participant, which is really impressive. You know, it's, it's, it's really crazy. Also people with high differentials, Boston Rob, number two, Terry with nine, uh, Colby also with nine wins, Eric Reichenbach, and uh, Laura is the uh, number one girl in six, Laura Moret with eight challenge wins. How do you like that? Yeah, I mean, Laura Moret, the... Big, uh, a big decline from there. Statistically, the most dominant challenge player of all time. I would, though, um, I feel like the Redemption Island duels are uh, the the one that I feel like is a little, is a little, I feel like that throws out it the... Waters it, does, it does it water, water it down a little bit. Because, because for instance... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for instance, like a guy like Boston Rob, who uh, doesn't have to go to Redemption Island at all, um, sure. You know, he ends up he ends up losing out to somebody like Ozzy, who spent a half a season at Redemption right. Island, and also Matt Elrod. And also, those challenges are just you know sort of uh, duels or trules as opposed to winning right. it versus a field of seven, eight, nine. A hundred percent. But you know, when when we're looking back on Survivor, and with all statistics, the information you're going to get, the quality of that information is going to always come down to your sample size, right? So yes. it's it's always going to come down to that. So with Survivor, there's a limited amount of events to look into. So we always want to include as many a events as possible. But obviously, we have to take into account there are going to be exceptions and notable exceptions very often. Like the inclusion of Ozzy into the history and to the pantheon of Survivor does a tremendous uh, amount of impact onto the statistics of everything, really. So there are some cool things that in there that we'll look at as time goes on. Uh, on the flip side of the winningest players, we put together a little list for fun of the worst challenge players of all time according to that same differential statistic. So versus a random player, uh, how these players compared to random players given how many times they were competing in challenges, the worst by a mile, number one, Sandra. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's good. Now this to me I feel like is uh, is slightly more meaningful because it tells me that you know uh, an average competitor that's competed in as many challenges as Sandra should have competed in should have almost four challenge wins for all right. of the challenges that she participated in and right. she has zero. Yes, she's got zero. So she's competed in so many challenges, individual challenges at that, that you would think that a random person would be expected to win four times, and she has won zero times. <laughs> so uh, she's a bit of an outlier, as we'll see. She actually has a bunch of records that only she holds. Uh, you know, she's obviously played some interesting games of Survivor Lifetime. So uh, also notable in there, Suri was number two. Uh, she mm -hmm. actually does have one challenge win, but Suri has been on three seasons, right, I believe, and she's it pretty deep in all three seasons, if I recall correctly. Well, no, in Survivor, Heroes versus So she had two deep runs and one time that she was out early. Okay, gotcha. But so still, even among all those times, she still would be expected more. She only has one win. And uh, beyond that, there are actually a bunch of players that have zero challenge wins that have played a lot. Uh, but once you leave the realm of like Tina, Jenna, Trish, Sri, and Sandra, those, those five are really the, the, the cream of the crop. Kind of, you know, so to speak. Yeah, the Mount Rushmore of challenge uh, terribleness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'm surprised to that. see Tina number five at this on this list because Tina, I think we think of her as uh, a pretty good challenge competitor, and she was somebody who was pretty decent yeah. on on Re Redemption Island, at least yeah. in this last pass go round. She won her way back into the game um, from Redemption Island, so it's right. I'm surprised to see her on this list. Yeah, I, I recall too. Also, my my memory of her is as one of those like very tough like uh, female carries. Like you know, she was a very powerful woman, and I was surprised to see her on this as well. But apparently, she had uh, not performed as we had hoped. Okay, there you go. So this leads me into my next question, which was actually my first question when we started when we started doing this research. I wanted to know: Does the team or the tribe that wins? Uh, 
uh, reward, do they are they more likely to win immunity? It was uh, it seemed to me like a pretty like uh, you would expect that to be the case that the team that wins reward is going to be more refreshed, more positive, more happy, more you know whatever. But I really wanted to find out. So this was actually the first question that I set David out to to discover. So what we found out was well. We looked, we looked at all the episodes that there were two separate challenges. There was a reward, and then there was a, an immunity, which is not every episode, obviously, as you know, Rob. So yeah. we took out all the episodes that had three or four tribes. We, we took out all the Redemption Island seasons, and when you took all of those out, there's actually a hundred episodes exactly of, of this dual reward immunity uh, mechanism. And amongst that, 59 times the tribe that won reward won immunity. 41 times the tribe that didn't uh, win, win reward won immunity. So it's very hard to say from the sample size of only 100, but uh, it does seem to see it does seem to say that the tribe that wins reward is more likely to win immunity than the other one, which makes sense. But the statistics do back that up to some degree. Yeah, how do and you feel about a, that? Uh, I think that's probably about what you would think. It's not a huge advantage. I think maybe you would think it would be it would happen more often than even 60 percent, but uh, I mean that that makes sense. The numbers back it up. Right. Well, it's, there are a couple there are a couple of things here, and one is that I believe not all rewards are created equal. Right. You know, if I give you an opportunity to go watch the new Adam Sandler movie, you know, sitting around there, that's not nearly as beneficial, I wouldn't think, as you know, getting like a beautiful feast and like. You what know, are you talking about? <laughs> that would be an awesome reward yeah. to go see. Uh, <laughs> to go see uh, what, was, uh, what was it? Step Step Brother? Uh, yeah. No, uh, it was, <laughs> I didn't it was, see the movie. Jack and Jill. Jack Jill. Yes. Jack and Jill. Yes. There you go. Uh, and the other thing, the other thing to take into account here is that it's possible that the tribe that wins reward is just stronger and better at challenges, which makes them more likely to win the next one. And it's not necessarily that the reward even has an impact. But again, because we have a small sample size, we have to make conclusions kind of uh, that aren't necessarily 100%. But it seems to me like it's likely that the tribe that wins reward is more likely to go on and win immunity. So the next twist of this, though, was if that's true for tribes, is it also true for individuals? So that's our, our third question, our third question here. Uh, and again, you know, I think it also depends on the kind of reward, stuff like that. Uh, how many challenges have you won, Rob? I have won one Survivor individual challenge. Okay, nice. <laughs> Which I think was just enough to keep me off of the expected wins list. I think I participated. <laughs> nice. I must have participated in probably, you know, about uh, you know, ten or twelve, and I won one. I'm glad you won one. It would be really a shame to see you on this list. On the list. Yes. What was what was the challenge that you won? I had to answer a quiz. It was sort of like a slam book of like, uh, who does, who's the hottest person in the tribe? Who is who would you trust with your life? Who's the biggest liar? Oh, and, nice. and and then you had to answer. Uh, then in the challenge, we had to answer for the group. Like, who did the group say sure. was what is the group you know, thing? Yes. Right. And so I, I really had my finger on the pulse. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. As 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 always. That's right. Right right on there. That's great. Right there. So we looked at individual. We looked at individuals. Uh, individuals' chances to win reward. Uh, as far as what is the impact uh, on immunity after these in individuals that win reward. And when we looked at it, it appeared that players that won reward were more likely to win immunity by a pretty significant degree. Uh, we'll we'll post these exact statistics and everything later, obviously, if you guys want to look at it. But it wasn't just the players that won reward, but as you would also expect, if, you know, as many times in Survivor when people win reward, they're also given the opportunity to bring other people along with them. And it wasn't just the winners, but also the people that were taken along for the rewards won significantly more often than the players that were not included for the reward at all. So over, over this data, it does seem to me like uh, the numbers were we would expect, given randomness, given complete randomness, we would expect about 28 people that won, that won reward to win immunity, and in truth it was 38. So there were 104 instances of chances where that could be the case, and we expected it to be 28, and actually it worked out to be 38. And as far as tagalongs, we would expect 40 tagalongs to have been uh, to one immunity, and instead 46 one immunity. So we uh, when look to indicate that winning reward is an indicator that makes you more likely not to be eliminated at uh, that tribal council. 
All right, now going back to something that you said earlier, where you said there are some people who are just better at the challenges and they're going to win stuff regardless of whether or not they won, they won before. Is there sure. any way that we are able to sort of isolate that, okay, this person is just good at challenges and they would have won whether or not they had reward? There, there is. You know, that's the that's next summer's project to go through, watch all the episodes, and to go back and identify and say, oops, nope, if that player hadn't dropped the the torch, then that wouldn't have happened. And you know, like to go back through, and then you can identify particularly more individually. But you know, we had to kind of work off of like the Wikipedia pages that kind of had things established and stuff like that. So to to make this not crazy for David, who had never seen an episode of Survivor when I dispatched him on this task, uh, we had to keep it a little little bit more generic, but I still think we, we learn some things out of uh, out of stuff like this, though. Now, how would you go about doing that? Like, would you have to, like, sort of, like, assign, like, Dungeons and Dragons, like, r ratings and numbers to each of these people? So if you say, like, well, Ozzy is, uh, you know, a nine dexterity and a nine <laughs> speed, and, and then, you know, he should be expected to, with those ratings, he should be expected to win a challenge, you know, 60% of the time that he competes in them. And right. he won challenges at a seventy percent clip, whereas you know Sandra is a you know a, a two in back two in strength and a one in this, uh, exactly. and she actually uh, is right on course for where she should be. Right. So if you were going to try to measure what the impact was of the reward alone, you would have to identify what the base stats are, like you just said, basically, right? And then you'd have to identify what that is. But unfortunately, because, you know, even though we've been through, you know, what is this, the 30th or 29th season of Survivor, like, there's really not enough... There's really not enough sample size to really go back through and just say, you know, these people haven't competed in enough seasons. Like, like you could do in baseball, for instance, you could very clearly kind of identify things like that when there are so many games to pull out and so many at bats. You know what I mean? There are only so many at bats for Survivor to, to pull from generally. So we gotta do the best we can. I've always talked about the idea of some sort of a Survivor computer. Do you think we'll ever reach a point where we'll be, we'll be able to sort of just like plug a cast into a computer and have it simulate the 39-day season like 10,000 times and tell us who would win how many times? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I think we're in, the, we're in the computing age. Anything is possible, Rob. My board lights up. I mean, God, anything is possible. You know, come on. Could, could there be a Survivor computer? I think so. I think so for sure. I mean, I think, you know, as far as I know, the the analysis that David did for this was the first or not much has been done like this. So if we took some of the heavier, more research stuff that's been used in plenty of other fields and took it to Survivor, I'm sure there'd be tons of cool data that would get spit out already. Never mind like a few years from now, you know, when we're on the moon okay. all watching Survivor, Survivor Mars or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is a hundred years from now. Who knows? That'd be, fan that'd be fantastic. That would be fantastic. Still, both of us. We'll do Survivor Mars recaps still, right? <laughs> yeah. We'll be like the old guys on the Muppets. There, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so let's yeah. move on to the next question here. So the next question we wanted to look at were, was, are players who sit out during challenges more likely to be voted out at that tribal council? I, I think instinctively you would think that they might be, right? Because they're perceived as weak or useless or, or whatever. What, what are your feelings on that J instinctively before we get into it? Well, just to, I don't know if you, if you know this uh, piece of trivia about me, but I actually was voted out on Survivor All-Stars on an episode where I sat out of a challenge. The only time I ever sat out of a challenge was the one time that I got voted out by my tribe as opposed to one other person. No, I did not. I did not know yes, that. That's a hundred percent accurate. The only time I ever sat down, the only day I ever sat out of a try, uh, a competition was wow. the day I got voted off on Survivor All Stars. Do you think that made a difference? Well, it, I think it did in that particular challenge because what happened was they, the group that was competing, needed to put together a puzzle at the end, and there was nobody on the on the group uh, right. that was able to put that puzzle together. So I think I would have actually been able to. Um, say, help save myself had I been into the challenge. And I, I don't think I would ever, if I was ever to play again, I think you'd have to drag me out kicking and screaming to not compete in the challenge. Right, right. I feel I feel kind of similar, like, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword kind of thing, you know? I, I like having my fate in my own hands. I think you're kind of similar with that. 
Rob, I, I wonder how much money I would pay to be on a season of Survivor with you. You know how much fun I would have with that? I think we would have so much fun. <laughs> I, well, I think that we would, cert- we would certainly have fun uh, during the day. I, I don't know how much. I think I would prefer to not be on a season of Survivor with you, all things being considered, because I wouldn't want to lose again. Oh, I, well, for, I, I, I got to tell you, we should start a, a write-in campaign that we should make a Survivor season Sester Nino versus Jay Carver, I think. It should <laughs> we'll take the world over. It would be great. Uh, again, I, I, I would prefer, can we do like <laughs> Sester Nino versus Billy Garcia? <laughs> Where's that okay. season? Okay, fair, fair enough. So, <laughs> our, our players who sit out during challenges at an increased re- risk of being voted out. Obviously, you're an example of that being the case. So, yes. we saw six, 62 votes where players had sat out in the challenges. And uh, again, if you look at a random sample, so uh, what you'd expect a random amount of the time a random person would be eliminated, you would expect to see 19.2 eliminations of all of those votes, and we actually only saw 18 votes. So, or 18 eliminations, rather. So as it turns out, the number of players who were voted out actually seems slightly less. Players that set out actually are slightly less likely to be voted out uh, rather than slightly more likely to be voted out. Sample size isn't huge, but there is no evidence to suggest that sitting out actually hurts you in the challenge. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's, you- it's right on par with, with, uh, with randomness. I mean, I think that, that makes uh, some sense, I feel like, um, that people, uh, I guess, that sit out of the challenge... You know they they've been winning for a reason, and right. they have they have a good group, and uh, you know it's not necessarily the weakest person that is the person you want to vote out. Maybe it was early on, but I feel like at this point in Survivor, just because somebody's not necessarily good in the challenges doesn't mean they're not a good part of the alliance. Sure. Also, how often can you can you even think of a player recently who sat out during the challenge as like a very big threat? Outside of that, like I, I have trouble thinking. Like if you're at if you're at tribal council, I can very often think of the person who was sitting out. You know, the Courtneys of China, and like you know, I can think very clearly of them. And I I don't really think of that person as being a threat to win the game very often. Like I'd actually love to find out what the what if there have been, how many players have sat out challenges and then actually won Survivor? Because I actually am curious if that uh, is an impacted thing as well. You know? I would probably, I'd have to go back and take a look at this. I would suspect that uh, the fa- the fan, the favorites in Survivor Caramoan probably sat Cochran out at some point. Especially yeah. because they were up in the numbers uh, in the pre-merge game, but I'd have to go back and take a look at that to see I'm what challenges. I'm sure there are a couple people who have sat out and then and then won, obviously, but I, I would be interested to see if that how that was compared to randomness. You know, that would be interesting, I think, to, to find that out there. Yeah. Well, if those those are the people that if then they make it to the merge, then you never worry about them. So if they don't get voted out pre-merge. The sit-out people they tend to be big threats after the merge. Right. I'm actually of all the data that I have here, the stuff I'm most interested to hear your thoughts on is all the alliance stuff because when I was reading through it, like it's really crazy all the stuff that goes back and forth. And you obviously have a much more uh, encyclopedic knowledge of you know alliances and things like that. Whereas to me, I obviously have like, oh, who, which, which Tina is that? And like, so I'm really interested to see some of Timber your Tina. thoughts on the alliance data. Yeah. Don't give so, me too well, much credit, but I'll I'll do what I can. I <laughs> okay. We'll we'll have to see. So the next question I have here about challenges is, is the tribe that has more remaining players more likely to win a challenge? It makes, seems like it makes sense. Instinctively, I felt like the answer was going to be yes, that the player, that, the team that has more players has been winning more challenges, they've been having more success, the snowball effect is, in, is, is probably in effect for that team, you know? They've been winning, they're going to keep winning, they're feeling good, etc. I mean, you, you probably agree with that, Rob, I would think? Yeah, if you have momentum, they, they talk a lot about momentum in Survivor. I know I follow some people uh, who write about sort of analytical stuff for football, uh, and for instance, uh, from uh, Football Outsiders, uh, and off the top of my head, I can't remember the uh, the name of the guy who uh, writes for that site, but he talks a lot about, uh, he gets mad when the announcers talk about the momentum has shifted in the football game because uh, he says that momentum is not a real thing in a right. football game, and the numbers don't dictate it. So to think that there's momentum on Survivor probably also uh, would not be the case, or at least something that you could debate. 
Sure, I definitely think it's up for debate. You know, uh, I I agree that like you know if, when you hear people and you hear commentators and casters be like, oh, this person is so dynamic, and, and you know, like what does that really mean in terms of like statistic or information? Like, it doesn't really mean anything, right? So I definitely agree with that, but. I do think there is something to be said for the team that is winning and continuing to win. You know, I do think there is there is some impact to that, even if it's not really something that's uh, necessarily visible uh, statistically. Perhaps, who knows? Now, do you believe in poker? Is there is there momentum? Absolutely, because. Because I feel like if I let's say let's say I'm uh, you know playing somebody and I'm winning I'm starting to win and I just keep winning whatever I'm gonna feel more capable of being able to bluff being able to try you know uh, moves that maybe I wouldn't feel capable of pulling off if I was if I was losing if a player has been losing they're more they're more likely to make decisions that are worse than if they were winning a lot of the times so I actually think that poker has a lot in common with what we're doing here with these statistics because another thing about poker that I think uh, compares very close to this is in poker we only get a very small set of, of hands to make our decisions on right you could sit down with me at a poker table play six hands and then hand number seven I'm making a decision for a hundred thousand dollars and I've only seen you for six hands so I have to use those six hands and make my my educated guess and be as hopeful possible so uh, I think we make similar kind of conclusions quickly uh, in poker as well we just try to guess Writer than our opponents, right? <laughs> yes, that's all I want to do. Just be a little more right. Okay, and uh, th I guess that's the same exact thing in Survivor. Yeah, that's right. It's all about your edges, you know. So yes. the question and we looked at, the question we looked at was, is the tribe with more remaining players more likely to win a challenge? And we looked at it, and uh, there were 108 wins by tribes that had numbers advantage compared to 88 wins for tribes that had the numbers disadvantage. So we did see. Uh, the tribe that was bigger win 55% of the challenges compared to the 45% of the challenges from the lesser staffed team. That sounds about right to me. How do you feel about that, Rob? Yeah, I think that sounds about right. I mean, the tribe that is up in the numbers, obviously, it's almost like if you if it was sports, it was like, uh, you know, is the team that's winning going to have, you know, a successful play on the next play that happens? And, and you say chances are yes, because they're winning. You know, they sure. were already... They were already, you know, good enough. So probably, you know, slightly more often than not, the team that's winning is going to continue to keep winning. Yeah, and, and you know, you have to also think that, like, let's say I have a tribe of five, you have a tribe of four. You have to play your worst team member. I don't have to. I can cycle out my worst teammate for whatever that is. That's a pretty big advantage in terms of like team rostering. Uh, so that definitely helps. We have a couple of examples here as far as like Cook Islands. Cook Islands, there was a eight to four disadvantage. Uh, the Ayutaki tribe, is that right? I Ayutaki. I don't know how your pronunciation goes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I definitely saw this season, but I don't remember the tribe name. But uh, Candice and Penner switched sides, and they were then it was eight, eight to four. Yes, and, the mutiny. Uh, and Ozzy carried that four-person team, uh, and they were they were the biggest uh, outlier to the data for us. But so there's still exceptions, of course. But you know. Jason, I've been reviewing your numbers, and I think that they're bollocks. <laughs> I, can I can I tell you something, Rob? My one of my favorite survivors, like top two, is Penner. It's true. I'm a huge Penner fan. Penner was the first survivor that I was an enormous fan of. I gotta say, I don't know why. We love him. He's a great yeah. character. Yeah, he's amazing. So uh, so we looked we looked from there we took and said all right so is there a correlation between players that win individual challenges and their chances of winning the jury vote you know so you look back and historically if i think back i think about uh, the guys that made the finals like Ozzy who crushed it but then didn't get the votes at the end but what do the statistics say is uh, how do you feel what do you think about that rob well, Player here's what I'm doing. I, I realize that I should close the packet, and so I'm not looking at the packet anymore. So <laughs> yeah, now yeah. I'm just going to now I'll be able to sort of, yeah, I'll be able to just pontificate. Yes. Um, and I do feel like that there's probably going to be, uh, hmm, you know, I, I go back and forth because then now, now, because now I'm thinking, you know, you have people who lost in the jury votes. Um, this is the qu the question is does w does dominance in challenges equal jury votes? Is there some correlation there? And yep. then you have so you have Kelly Kelly Wigglesworth in the first in the first season who yep. won four immunity challenges. You have Colby who won four immunity challenges. You have Ozzy who's won a lot of immunity challenges. And those are three people off the top of my head who uh, who did not get jury votes. But then you also have people 
like Nebraska, who won who won challenges and then also got the jury votes. You have people like Brian Heideck who won challenges and got the jury votes. So exactly. I'm going to say uh, at the end of the day, uh, I'm going to say it's probably close to no correlation. Yep, that's uh, that's actually right on the money there. So as it, <laughs> look at that, look at that. This should be a game show, Rob. We should have done win Jason Somerville's money, and I should have just asked you these questions. <laughs> done and done. Yeah. <laughs> so as it turns out, the the sole survivor has won more challenges than the runner-up. Uh, 14 of 25 seasons. The other three were tied. So it's not really enough of a correlation to really suggest anything. Uh, and the interesting thing, though, that we looked when we, when we saw this was that a player has made it to the jury vote seven times without winning one immunity challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, but of those seven, there's only been one winner. Do you know the one winner that's never won a challenge? Uh, but that would be Sandra. That's right. Yeah, that's correct. And she did it twice. <laughs> oh, I love I love the bell back and forth. It's great. Uh, yeah, so again, this is another exception for, for her here that she's uh, another bit of an outlier. But it does. It looks like being strong at challenges doesn't really uh, equate to winning uh, at the final tribal council. And Later let me not. just put a little asterisk also on Tina's win because the challenge that Tina won in Australia was because uh, I, I rewatched this over the summer. Um, they had like the survivor like uh, like coffee bar outback uh, coffee bar, and <laughs> what they did was they had like a com this giant computer from the year it was the, it was they they filmed this November two thousand. They had this giant like old iMac, and it was like all right, it's the survivor coffee bar, and you get to or survivor internet cafe, and you get to write home, and her family. Actually, Katie Collins even answered the five trivia questions, right? They had, like, a quiz that they asked the family over, like, AOL Instant Messenger. Oh, wow. And that's the challenge that she won. So Tina didn't even do anything other than have a smart family to win the challenge that she won in Australia. Right, yeah. So there, there are obviously a lot of, like, hilarious exceptions like that that, you know, maybe shouldn't really count and things like that. But, yeah, interesting, interesting that that's true. There you go. See, that's why you're the expert, bro. That's it. You just proved it. Yeah. Oh, well, again, let's not get. Don't put me up on a pedestal then, because it's a, it's a it's a quick fall. It's I know this. It's a quick disappointment ride. I, yeah. I, I, I get that. I, but I have good news for you. The very What's next that? question is a question that, as as David wrote, it's a question that Rob himself asked on a recent podcast, and the question good. was, "What is the historical win percentage in team challenges based on buff?" No, this I thought this was really interesting because, yeah. So I thought this was really interesting. So uh, there's one color. There's one color with an 80 percent, almost 80 percent win rate. You want to take hmm. a guess? Well, I gotta think it's a color that they didn't use much, and uh, because I think it would sort of it would sort of weigh out. Um, yep. I'm trying to think of uh, what it could be. You know, I don't know off the top of my head uh, whatever color uh, a certain tribe was so in. Uh, I'll tell you. So I'll tell you the season. How about that? You're right okay. about all that. So the season was Palau. The season was yeah. Palau, and it was the Karor tribe. Yes. And they won 11 of 14 challenges. Oolong, who was blue, yes. and uh, so the color was brown. There you brown. Go. Brown. There you go. Okay. Only time so, they they had to retire it. It was too yeah. hot. So brown, eleven and three is our winningest color. And then there's a very very big drop down into the rest of the colors that they use more often. But uh, second winningest was purple with fifty five percent. Third winningest was red. Fourth was yellow. Uh, black, fifty uh, percent exactly. And then the rest are losing colors: uh, blue, forty seven percent; green, forty six point nine percent. And then the worst. By a lot, and uh, I believe, pretty sure that Tony was on this color buff team last season. Uh, but orange, the worst. Orange. Orange is the worst at 42 percent. So if you're hanging out with your buddies and it's uh, two colors and orange is the worst, get against orange and feel comfortable because uh, <laughs> orange has not done too well a lifetime. Look, everybody knows orange is the worst color. You don't want to be in orange. That's why I wear blue is for police. Police <laughs> officer, we wear the boys in blue and uh, no orange buffs. That's right. That's right. And he did it with he did it with the orange buffs too. That's uh, how strong Tony is right there. Good for Tony. Good for there Tony. You go.
The the most lopsided season in terms of challenges was uh, Fiji, where uh, Moto, who was green, won 12 of 13 against Ravu, who was orange. Once yes. again, orange. And, and again, that was a season where it was like a heaven and hell twist, where it was like uh, haves and have-nots. So that there there was momentum, and that, that like that's probably a season that skews the numbers because one tribe had a luxurious camp, and the other right. tribe had like really lousy accommodations. And the tribe that would win would get to stay win the ch- uh, challenge, got to stay in the, the in nice. shelter, and right. so it became sort of like a you know perpetual thing that was happening. Right. Yeah. That those sort of things are are pretty widespread in Survivor, and obviously because they do these twists, it it does like twist the statistics a little bit. But again, you know, we want to include as much as much data as possible here on our statistics walking tour. So yeah. Do you like that there? This is what I do all the time yes. in my life, by the way. Very good. That, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, if you were listening to the audio version of this, Jason is doing some uh, <laughs> some pantomime of uh, fingers right. walking. That's uh, <laughs> and it's a good it's a good thing that you didn't include any statistics from opposite worlds. Uh, what what is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a show on on sci-fi that we podcast about during the Survivor off season where I didn't know. one one group of people lives in the past and one people and one group of people they live in like a cave and the other people live in the future in a futuristic house and then whoever wins the challenge uh, has to they get they get to pick where they want to live, and the team that lived <laughs> in the future kept uh, kicking the ass of the team that lived in the cave. Go figure. <laughs> wow, what a shocker! Who <laughs> who would have thought? Who would have thought that had happened? Wow. <laughs> People oh. that never saw Survivor Fiji. Yeah, apparently. Apparently, this is actually a great segue into another classic uh, polarity kind of a uh, kind of a thing here. As uh, we took a look into uh, men versus women, the breakdown of men versus women uh, as our second like cluster of statistics here that we want to take a look at. So the very first thing we wanted to look at was how often do we win challenges against women? Is there actually an uh, an advantage for men in the challenges against women. I, I felt like there probably was, you know, because it's hard to build the challenges to t- totally negate all the strengths of the men on a athletic level. Uh, how do you feel about that instinctively, Rob? Uh, do men have an inherent advantage in the individual challenges over women? I would say that they, that they probably do. Um, but I don't think it's going to be uh, a very lopsided number. But I would say that I, I think men ha- have won more than 50% of the individual challenges. So given the distribution of players, because they're not exactly even men to women, we would expect to see that men would win 244 immunity challenges, and we would expect to see that women would win 237, right? Assuming okay. complete evenness and balance. And in truth, men have won almost 300, whereas women have won about 190. So there's a, actually a pretty big differential between the two where men win 61.2% of the time uh, against uh, the women, or rather compared to the women. So it does seem like there is actually an inherent advantage for men as the challenges are designed or whatever whatever there is there. Okay, well that makes, uh, that makes sense, and that's actually more than I would have thought. Yeah, it was higher than I would have thought as well because, you know, they, they obviously do try to engineer these challenges to be pretty balanced. But uh, it seems like even despite that, I, I would actually be curious to know how that breaks down as far as, like, the first half of the show against the last half of the show because I would think, I actually am pretty sure that they've gotten better at balancing the challenges in the last half of the show, whereas in the first half or even, like, the first, like, ten seasons, did they really think about making every challenge equally winnable for men and women? I, I'm not so sure. We'd have to go back and take a look at the numbers. Like, like when you when you think back to the, there was a challenge on your season uh, in Amazon, Rob. When you were in Amazon, there was a challenge with the uh, it was it was something that I had never seen before as like a more modern viewer. When I went back to see your season, they had like an archery thing and like a like a bunch of like Amazonian weapons they had to use. Like to me, that's a pretty big inherent advantage for you know the men than the women who are you know uh, I don't know. How do you feel about that? Probably agree. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think of some of the weapons duels uh, that they've had for individual immunity, and um, I know that they did they did do um, it in the Amazon where Matthew won, but they did do like a gun shooting challenge, like they had like muskets in Survivor Pearl Islands, and Dara ended up winning that one. So um, 
you know, if some of these things are like, you know, where it's like throwing a javelin, uh, maybe somebody who's uh, more physically strong uh, might do better. But uh, if you're a Hunger Games fan, you know, just because, uh, you know, archery is not necessarily only for guys. That's right. I, yeah. Hey, I agree. <laughs> I, I agree. Can't can't argue with that. But it does look like, historically speaking, that the challenges have been slightly favored to the men for, for whatever reason. And I think you'd have to actually kind of dig into that a little bit more to see what it is. Because I don't think it's necessarily just a strength advantage. There might be some other factors that uh, impact that, that as well. So we took a, a similar question to that and said, what's the average survival rate for men versus women? And so we defined uh, survival as a moment of elimination. If ever there's an elimination, whatever it is that's a moment of survival or not so so uh, so we didn't we didn't consider uh, we did not consider being voted out an elimination for Redemption Island you had to actually be eliminated from the game for that but everything else uh, as you would expect would be there so there were for the men 2100 times of an elimination 2162 eliminations total and men survived at a rate of 8.6, so they've survived an average of 8.6 eliminations, whereas women survived an average of 8.2 over a similar sample size of numbers. So men tend to survive a little bit more than women, but not significantly greater. So it seems pretty balanced in the survival as far as being eliminated uh, chances go. Yeah. So strategically, not a big difference between the sexes, which not is probably, a big difference. we probably w would have assumed. Right. And actually, another thing that was interesting and contrary to what I would have expected was the the first 14 seasons are actually almost exactly even between men and women. And only in the recent 15 seasons has there been a separation between men and women. So men mm -hmm. have only started to edge ahead recently uh, as opposed to the first 15 seasons where you would think it would be the reverse of that. Uh, but no. Hmm. The more you know. I wonder, yeah. is it... Is it more pageant patties being casted? Is it that we've seen worse women being cast for the show? I, I don't know. It, it could be that. It could be. Uh, it could be just drafting more aggressive men. It could be drafting more aggressive characters. It could be. Yeah. It could be a, a number of things that I think could be involved in that. But uh, discovering that was a was a bit of a interesting uh, interesting note. I thought. Okay. Uh, all things considered. Because you know, so so there is clearly some advantage for for men for men over women to some degree. So we wanted to kind of keep figuring out what what the cause of that was. So the next thing that we looked at, as far as the men versus women dynamic, was how likely is it that men will find a hidden immunity idol versus the women? Now this is obviously a pretty recent you know uh, addition to the Survivor life. So not I don't even remember when the first season was where there were was a hidden immunity, but it was somewhere in the low yeah tens. Guatemala yeah. yeah what number was that eleven. Uh, Eleven, right? So, uh, so uh, given that, so we didn't include people who benefited from the idol. So, uh, like the Eric Andrea thing, just counts as Eric finding the idol. So we kept it as the discoverers of the idol. Historically speaking, there have been fifty hidden idols found, and thirty-nine of them found by men, eleven yeah. by women. So actually, very significantly uh, leaned towards uh, men finding idols there for whatever reason that is. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if you know uh, men are inherently you know looking for the idol more, like they feel like they need it, or because there are men because men like to hunt. Uh, they're hunting for the idol, or they're I, alpha males. They need it, or they that's feel right. threatened more. <laughs> And it, women are more like more likely to stay behind and work on their social game rather than look for the idol, or uh, if if there's just uh, something about that the that uh, it's in places where you need to be somewhat athletic to get to it, such as like by climbing a tree or digging or, or swimming yeah. across a you know a lake. Right. Yeah, uh, you know, we didn't really have any any great uh, insight to that. And, you know, I, I did initially think, is it like a hunter versus gatherer kind of thing? Are the women just not going out individually and hunting for idols? And has that just not happened so far? I mean, you know, you think of the big Russell, uh, or sorry, the big idol hunters, and obviously you think of Russell, Russell, you know, Russell's on here a lot. You know, I actually have a list of all the uh, hidden immunity uh, idol uh, finders and Gary, Terry, Yule, Yao Man, Mookie, Earl, Todd, James, Ozzy, Jason, Amanda, Parvati, Sugar, Brendan, Taj, Russell, 
Russell, Eric, Russell, Russell, Tom, JT, Parvati, Sandra, Marty, Nanka. Remember that? Oh, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Ralph, Boston Rob, Christina, Ozzy Coach, Troy Zan, Sabrina Kim, Jonathan Malcolm, Abby Maria, Reynolds twice, Malcolm twice, Eric, Tyson twice, Tony twice, Garrett, LJ, and Spencer. Boom. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> all your all your idol winners lifetime. Fantastic. Yeah. So it, I thought that was interesting there that it was very pretty very ma- you know masculine based but I, I wonder if that's again maybe not like a I'm sure we'll see aggressive women that will start looking more often especially as people are finding without clues these days so we'll have to see. Your Christina Kells of the world. Yes, that's right. So uh, the next question that we had on this men versus women kick was, if men are outnumbered by women or vice versa, the women outnumbering the men, how often does the gender that has fewer people remaining get voted out? What are your uh, quick thoughts on that, Rob? I think that off the top of my head I would say it's higher than than uh, a 50-50. That, but... You know, I'm trying to think of the seasons where that ultimately happened, and, and the, the only the two that could really come to mind are in Survivor, fans versus favorites, where the women, Parvati and Sari and Amanda had sort of like a a women thing, and then also in Survivor One World, also where Kim had the women thing. So I wonder if maybe there's the more I think about it, maybe not a strong correlation. Right. So, uh, like you correctly pointed out, the best dynamic of the all-girl alliance was One World, where the final five were all women. Um, but you know, Vanuatu so, also. Yeah. Uh, say that again. In, in Vanuatu, uh, the women had a big advantage, but they just couldn't seal the deal with getting the last guy out. Also. Right. Right. Well, uh, that's right. That was with Chris. Right. That was yes. that season. Um, right. So we looked at it, and there were 250 votes where there was an inequality in genders. And at a random, uh, random level, you would expect it to be 96 votes out for the major- for the minority gender. And in actuality, it was only 83. So actually, the gender that was in the minority actually survives more often than the gender in the majority. Believe it or not, there is. There is not really a uh, mass proclivity towards the girl power, you know, guy power sort of thing. Believe it or not. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, be- I believe it. There, there you go. There is actually uh, the effect actually becomes even more powerful when there is only one player left, and uh, there have been 22 votes where there was just one man remi- re- remaining in the tribe, and that man ended up being voted out only twice of all 22 times. How crazy is that? So hold on, say this again. So there's 22 times that there's only one and guy one left in the tribe. Now, yep. probably like five or six of those times is in Survivor Vanuatu. Uh, yep. Uh, and so I know uh, we had Johnny Fairplay. Uh, all, one of those times had to have been Johnny Fairplay when he got voted out by Sandra and Lil. Uh, okay, I didn't, did not see that season, so I have to go to you on that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, so, so I'm looking for what the... Uh, the other time that two women voted out a man, or or that uh, a few, uh, well, Eric Reichenbach voted out by the exactly. women. Yep. Uh, and then was, what about in Survivor One World of the women voting out uh, Tarzan? You're so good, you know. You're so good. You got it right perfectly. That's right. Uh, Tarzan and uh, and when Eric and Natalie had their thing going on there. That was yeah. uh, that was it there. So, uh, in reverse, there have been 16 votes where there was just one woman remaining, and uh, that last woman standing was only voted out two times of the 16 uh, potential times that she could have been uh, voted out. Okay. So, so one of those times. Oh, let me let me hold oh, yeah, on. Go go go. go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right. So that's gonna be uh, Jan in Survivor Thailand. I don't have that on my list here. I don't know if that's a it's a, who's who's overlooked that, but that's not on my list here. Okay. Uh, how about do uh, do you have uh, Aaron Lobdell in Survivor Token Jeans? I do not. I Let have... me make sure I understand the question right. So this is the time that that two that that the last woman voted out of the tribe was voted out. It's the last woman standing. Uh, I don't know if it's the last woman standing in the game. It might be the last woman standing in the game, not just the tribe. So I'm sure there have been last women standing in. Uh, in uh, I think this is post. Specifically, post merge. I believe it's post merge specifically, because otherwise the number would probably be bigger. Uh, so yeah. So the two that I have, I'll give you. It was like a small hint. Okay. Well, yes. Uh, help me. Help me out here. 
All right, so the first, the two that I have on this list are uh, there's one event in Fiji. Do you know who it was in Fiji? Uh, no. Lisi. Lisi asked her tribe mates to vote her out of the game. I guess she was the last woman standing. And uh, Survivor Nicaragua, where Holly Hoffman was voted one day before the final tribal council. Okay, That's well, that right. that makes sense, the Holly Hoffman thing. Lisi, uh, I mean... Uh, I think we might ha we might have to go back uh, and, and take a look at this one because Lisi. We might have to look at this like, one. Yeah, Lisi was out right around the merge in Survivor. Uh, maybe, and, and maybe, this is, maybe this does include pre-merge data then. Uh, like uh, like I said at the beginning, I am the executive producer, so if there are any complaints on methodology, we're gonna tweet at D Williams MMA and say we'll hey, go Rod, back. What's up? Yeah, we'll go back <laughs> and with that, uh, we'll go back and take a look at this one. This one. Yeah, right. back to the drawing board on. Yeah, so uh, the number one example, like you had said, of a player thriving despite being outnumbered was Chris, uh, Chris Doherty from uh, Vanatu, and the final seven was all women and Chris, and Chris managed to ship that. So that seems pretty insane, but he did manage to do it. Okay. There we go. Okay. There we go. Uh, what's the next, the next category we want to go into? That's right. So the next category I want to get into is the the big meaty one for for what I think you'll really enjoy, which is the alliance stuff. Yes. So this uh this is obviously the trickiest one to go through because you know as you know very well, Rob, there are no nothing is for sure in life, and especially that goes to survivor alliances. So uh you know given that there are no real clear you know uh, promise rings on people's fingers when they make alliances, it's a little bit more nebulous than we might like. But uh, that being said, what we did was there is a uh, Wikipedia page on the Survivor Wiki page that has all the alliances listed, including the founders and the leaders. And so that was what we used as our data for this. So if you disagree, you think there should be more or whatever, uh, you can blame them because that Take was it up what with we the Survivor Wiki. Yeah, that was yeah. what we used. We used for this. So the question we want to know is: Is the founder of an alliance more likely to be voted out than the other members of the alliance? By their own alliance or just in general? I think it's just in general. I feel like okay. it's just. I feel like it's just in general. Um, so, I feel like the, uh, are the founders of an alliance more likely to get voted out than the uh, than than the yeah, other no. people? That's right. So, I I think this is tough because everybody is pretty likely to get voted out of Survivor. Um, sure. You got a you know a 15 out of 16 chance to get voted out when you go on a season, or a 19 out of 20 percent chance to, sure. or I guess to make the final two or whatever. But I will say that this probably the data points to a slightly slight advantage for the people that form alliances because sometimes they're going to work. Yeah, and uh, and it, it seems like from all the research that we did that it is kind of a high risk, high reward situation that. Uh, if you found if you found alliances, there there are 11 of 28 sole survivors uh, were credited as people who created an alliance at some point. So actually, under half were the true creators. Uh, 12 other players created alliances and made it to the final tribal council, but then lost to the at the final jury vote. So uh, you know we did a whole bunch of research as to why that was. You know whether it was the alliance stays strong. Is you know whether it's the leader is is annoying you know but the alliance is in majority uh, tribal swaps you know there are a whole bunch of reasons why alliances can fall apart uh, you know obviously blindside stuff like that bizarre or poor leadership decisions players revolt and you know whatever so there are lots of reasons things fall apart but it does seem that uh, to answer our original question the founder or sometimes the leader of the alliance has been voted out first. 15 times, first 15 times, compared to an expected 10.7 times based on random chance. So it does seem that the founders of the alliances are voted out more often, but that being said, it seems like alliance founders tend to win the game more often than those that do not found alliances, so you're more likely to win if your plan does go as you hope it does. Yes, it's a go big or go home strategy. That's right. Yeah. I, 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 like, those. I like those over here. Yeah, <laughs> makes, it makes sense. You, you play to win the game. We swing for the fences over here, you know? Yeah. So the, the next question that I had, if that was the case, was, okay, so how often does the player in the largest or the most dominant alliance get voted out? Very simple. How often are there blind sides, generally speaking? What are your, what are your thoughts on what do you think, the, how often blind sides occur, Rob? I think not that often. I would say maybe roughly, you know, 
thirty percent of the time. You know, uh, it's not. I guess it really depends on uh, things and how we're really defining the blind sides. But I feel like the, right. does the person does a person in the majority alliance get voted out? I feel like for the most part, that answer is no. Right. So what we did here was the question was how often does a player in the largest, most dominant alliance get voted out? And our definition of dominant was simple, is that if does the alliance have more than half the remaining players left? So that was how we defined dominant, is does it have more than half the players remaining in the tribe? So we looked at the numbers, and it turns out that the dominant tribes successfully voted out an outsider 177 times, while they voted out one of their own members only 41 times. So it works out to be a rate of about 18.8% from internal, uh, internal voting. Okay. So about well, that you lower thought. than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you know, obviously, it's obviously uh, there are plenty of good examples of alliances eating its own. You know, uh, Pearl Islands was one that uh, you know obviously had a. I believe it had like a two person. Every time they had enough more than two people, or they were voting out. Is that right? In Pearl Islands, they had some weird sort of like. They had a lot of crazy tribal councils in uh, Survivor Pearl Islands. I think it would be hard yeah. to figure out what the majority alliance is from week to week, but uh, right. lots of blind sides in that season. Right, right. And uh, I think we looked at it and said the most successful alliance, obviously, is South Pacific. We thought that was probably pretty uh, a pretty good example of the most successful alliance in Survivor history. Actually, we looked at that. Obviously, Cochrane was the one that flipped, and then uh, he was the first to go once it was only the core, the family. Yeah, a uh, so, uh, What's that? A paganging. That's right. That's yep. right. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. So the the easy question from that then is that okay. So if the the dominant tribes vote out twenty percent of the time, then how often do the players that break the alliance? Uh, how often do those players get voted out? Well, how how do they do after after they make the blind side? What are your thoughts on that, Rob? Well, I think that the person that breaks the alliance uh, probably loses uh, almost 100% of the time because I can't think of a person who broke the alliance and then went on to win the season. So right. uh, I feel like it's these numbers are not going to be great for these alliance breakers. Right. So one thing is really interesting here. Players who flop almost certainly make it to the last half of the game, right? Those people survive their their moment of flippery, right? But then they they tend to get it to the last half of the game. However, they tend not to do very well once they get there. Uh, actually, uh, many of the people who flop tend to make it to the end, which is a strategic decision to bring them to the end because everybody hates them, obviously. Unless you're Will. Uh, uh, right. Uh, the only time, only time, and I'll let you guess. The only there is one time that a player flopped in an alliance and then won the game anyway. Only one time. I I, um, I could see maybe. Are we considering? Oh, well, uh, is Tony the person that's flipping well, on his own alliance? Well, the way the way that we the way that we considered the flip the way that we the way that we defined flipping in this case was uh and it was not exactly the same because it wasn't just her but when Parvati technically flipped and betrayed her alliance, she did so with Amanda and Sari, and it looks like when we looked through, it's only when people flop in numbers that they're able to have a shot at winning the game. Yeah, like, if, Ty like Tyson with... Like Tyson and Gervais, Gervais and Monica. And Monica, right, yes. Yeah, so exactly. when, if you're going to flip on your group, you need to do it with a... You can't be like Chaos Cass or Cochrane in South Pacific and just be one person because you make too many enemies. Right, exactly. So we looked at that and said that when we looked at one or two players who flopped, they never won the game. It only it required people that, that had people go with them in order to have a shot at, at winning at the end. And then when there's two or three left in the final three, then the, you have to vote for a flopper, obviously. So uh, so uh, that was the case there. We actually, we actually only found a couple examples of people who flopped in threes. You know who else flopped in threes? That would be right. That would be you yourself, apparently, back in the day. Uh, well, that, I mean, that was... I, I would chronicle that more as a, a flop of one um, as yeah. opposed to a, fl a flop of three. Um, what, what, do, what does the number say? Well, we don't have any numbers on that, but we were just looking back at when there were flops, and apparently it's considered as uh, that you, Matt, or Matthew, and Alex flipped together. 
that's what that's what they that's what they're calling a flip. Oh, in the oh, studio. oh, okay. So we fl- we flipped against the tribe of men. Yeah, I, I guess yeah. you could say that's fair to say. That's fair to say. We fl- if you want to say that we flipped against the our original Tamaki tribe. At right. The, yeah. Yeah. So uh, so it does look like that flopping could be a good idea. It does help you survive, but it doesn't. It's not a good idea to go it alone. The chaos castaway is not not the path to success, survivor success and glory and hall of fame status. Man, apparently. that's crazy because so many people are have been saying like, uh, man, chaos cast that she really had the whole game figured out. I'm gonna play like chaos cast. Historically, no, no, <laughs> so, who knows? All right. Wait. So uh, another question that I was a little bit survived at is how often does the winning player come from the tribe to have more players at the merge? How often does the player who wins the game come from the tribe that has an advantage in players when the when the tribes merge? Okay. I would think that the answer would be a lot. What do you think, Rob? Well, how are we count? Like, what happens? Like, let's say in season one, the tribes merge at five and five, but the first person voted off is from Pagong, and it's five to four. Are we considering that an advantage of the merge, or because that they started the merge five five, that's even? Uh, I believe that we are saying that it is tribes that enter the merge. I think okay. that that would be counted as even. I I'm, trying, well, we well, I'm trying to think of the the people that the people that did it from the inferior position, uh, and that would be. Uh, I'm trying to think. Are are we counting? Are we counting? Uh, I guess the sep. Well. Hmm, Vesepia is a tricky one because she was on the she swapped right. to the tribe. So uh, just like in a traditional sense, you have uh, Chris. Right. Get it? That's put. It. How how many people are we looking for? So uh, there were. Well, it depends on what you want to get out of this question. But the the core question is how often does the winning player come from the tribe to have more players at the merge? Right. right. How so, many times? How many times did the person who was inferior tribe win the game? Uh, right, so exactly. So there are 28 seasons, obviously, that have completed, and uh, at, at the time of the merge, there were eight times the tribes were even, so there were only 20 times where there was a disadvantage. Of okay. those 20 times, how many times did the sur- sole survivor come from the tribe with more players? Well, I will want you to tell me how many times, and then I want to guess okay. who they are. 11. 11 of the 20. Only 11 of the 20. How crazy is that? That that is crazy. That is uh that is less than uh, or that that is uh, a bigger number than I would have thought. Uh, so I don't know if I'm going to come up with a uh, nine yeah. off the top of my head. So uh, that, yeah, that it's it's a big list. number. But I actually thought it would be more because uh, I guess I guess what actually this kind of proves is that there are a lot of final the final tribe inner alliance changing. Like the the core starting alliance loyalties don't necessarily indicate who's going to win the. Finally, which I thought was crazy, because you would think if you have a dominant tribe of seven, seven against five, all right, guys, we're going to make the final seven for sure, and then one of the winners is going to come from that seven. Historically speaking, that just doesn't happen. It's just not not true. Okay, so you got Natalie White, you got Denise yep. also. Uh, she's going to be one of these people. Uh, yep. I'm trying to think uh, re- real fast. Bob, right? So uh, so I have a list of all the winners, their tribe, and how many players they had at each tribe, and what the margin was between them. So you want to go through the disadvantages? Me, yeah, just give me the give me the nine that were uh, at the in the image. Uh, so the nine that were at a disadvantage. So let's see. So uh, uh, the sepia. Okay. Right. Uh, in Marquesas. Yeah, yeah that, I threw that one out because she switched to Rotu. And they had actually had seven, but had she seven. was in the she was in the, the group of seven, even though she started on the like she was like the group of More seven. Of uh, yeah, the original. Yeah. It's it's it, that one's a little tricky. When there's yeah, a swap, right. it's confusing. It, exactly, and all these alliance things obviously are a little bit on the like nebulous, confusing side. But you know, we still wanted to try to see if we could get data out of this. So. Uh, the other tribes that are at or people that are at disadvantages. Uh, Chris for Venatu started. Yeah. Davi and went to Yasora. Haven't seen. I actually hadn't seen the Marquesas season yet either. So, uh, the other two, uh, Yule from Cook Islands, but oh. you know you got to count the idol. Obviously, is a pretty tremendous impactor in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Todd from Fei Long in China. Yeah, he was at a disadvantage and and came back. 
Uh, sorry, no, Todd wasn't. Sorry, I uh, misread this. So Yule and Earl. Earl in Fiji was at a disadvantage. Um, and then Bob was down one. Fang against Coda. You're right about that. JT and Token Teens. JT. Uh, Natalie, obviously, from FOA, FOA. And then Denise in uh, Philippines. There you go. She was down um, in that thing. So there you yeah. go. All right. All right. So, All right. So, what, so what did we learn? That that uh, in being up in the numbers at the merge is not necessarily a recipe for winning the game? Not necessarily significant, believe it or not. As absolutely crazy as that is to say, it does not seem it's super significant, if you can believe that. So we have... Uh, I think that's the third of the the third and I think the final big bucket. There's only a couple uh, a couple little sections left here. Some uh, miscellaneous questions that I want to know the answer to very badly. So uh, I'm really excited about this part. These are these are special directed questions that we get to talk about here for our final little segment here. So my uh, my one of my core questions I asked David was: Is the number of confessionals in an episode? Uh, an indicator on whether or not the player is going to be voted out. Because I'm obviously, both of us are obviously very big into production and editing, and I've always been curious if there is such a thing as a winner's edit, or particularly in an episode, as an elimination edit. Yeah. So, what do you think about that, Rob? I believe that there is. I believe that there are people, you know, when when you see people who are, bare, are, are mostly invisible, and then all of a sudden they start getting a lot of camera time, I say, uh-oh. Uh, right. red flag goes up for me because that person, uh, there's a good chance they're going home. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I definitely uh, think that's definitely makes sense to me, and that was what I thought as well. So uh, just so you guys understand what our what our what our uh, methodology was here, we included uh, voiceovers, we included um, uh, a, if there was a gap of 10 seconds or more, we included a new confessional. There was a somebody else had done this already and had made a confessional count, so it was easy for us to go back through and look at. Uh, what we didn't count the end credits confessional, and we didn't count the final words of a player. So those okay. we all took out. Uh, and we also didn't want to just do it by number of confessionals because it would too often weigh towards the players in the end game, right? Because obviously, make the final four, you're going to get your share of confessionals. So yeah. we wanted to do it by per, by percentile per episode instead. So we did it comparatively instead of uh, abstractly. Sounds good. Uh, so having done that, then we did uh, we took a look at the data. And uh, players who have the most confessionals in an episode are almost twice as likely to be voted out uh, versus players as you would expect by random chance. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, the players who get a very quiet episode in the lower percentiles of, of uh, confessionals are less than half as likely to be voted out. So there is definitely a positive correlation between airtime and that player being voted out. So that is a real thing. It's a complete verified statistical true thing that there is a, a, a a bit of a spoiler given to you by the edit. At least an indicator that uh, what, could, what might happen. So, the, the ideal Survivor player would be Purple Kelly. Uh, uh, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Is that ideal? I don't know. I don't know. Look, if, you <laughs> just, if, if you're just seen and not heard, that means you have a, very <laughs> good, a much better chance of staying in the game than somebody who we see all the time. That's true, but there actually was a very cool statistic, and there were 13 players in Survivor history that got voted out at the end of an episode and didn't have one confessional. Not oh one. God. How crazy is that? Welcome, that is for, welcome to Survivor. Thanks for playing. Uh, who are some of those luminaries from that list? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have oh, that okay. list for you, but, uh, but in the last season, there there were players who got voted out with just having one confessional in each episode, um, and both those episodes were pretty late in the season, but I don't have a list of who they are. So you probably can think about it if we really think about back to like the surprising eliminations, but apparently they can do that sometimes, give you one confessional and boot you out of there. Boom. That's Brutal. it. Done. Brutal. That's right. So... Well, related to that, though, was, my, was the other question that we just talked about before was, is the number of confessionals that a player receives throughout the whole season an indicator of whether or not they're going to win the game? Now, I would think the answer is yes, that you know uh, there is definitely going to be a correlation between confessionals and winning the game, but not necessarily because I think there's an obvious, uh, pointing, uh, obvious example in Russell who got tons of confessionals and yet didn't win the game. What do you think about that, Rob? Um, I think that overall there's probably going to be a correlation between people who have have a lot of confessionals and the people that that win the game. I think that um, we're because we're gonna we need to see their story. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so there have been 28 final tribal councils. 
15 that had two players, and 13 that had three players. Uh, so in the ones that were two players, the player with more confessionals throughout the season won uh, nine of the 15. So only 60% of the time, the player that had more confessionals won the game in the heads-up version. So say that one more time. So nine out of 15 times, the player with more confessionals won. Yep. All right, that's, exactly. that's, a, that's a good correlation. Yeah, I, I feel a like little it, bit. A little yeah. bit more, a little bit of an indicator there. And in the 13 uh, final trouble councils that had the three players uh, making the final vote, the the player with the most confessionals won seven of the 13 times, or 54 percent. Right. So that's, that's pretty, pretty good. Significant. Yeah, considering that there's three people. Yeah, exactly. Having more than half is is obviously great. So. So uh, it does seem that the combined, the player with the most confessionals has won 16 of 28 seasons uh, compared to what you would expect on random chance would be 11.8. So uh, it does seem that players who are more featured heavily in the episodes uh, have an increased chance of actually winning uh, Survivor as, as a whole. Not necessarily a for sure thing, though. You know, the biggest gap ever was Russell versus Natalie. Russell got 108 confessionals in his season and uh, went up against Natalie, who had a whopping... 15 confessionals uh, in the course of her season. And uh, Russell obviously did not win. So, uh, yeah, there you go. I'm the greatest confessional maker of all time. <laughs> Can I, I... I don't think I actually told you, but I loved the podcast that you did with Russell over the summer. Yeah, the, the explicit director's <laughs> cut. I listened to it. It was great. It was awesome. I loved it. Yeah, that, that was uh, that was very good. Uh, Russell actually had uh, 108 beers that night, also. Oh, <laughs> oh wow! That was that was how that worked. Yes. Oh no, <laughs> no big deal. Uh, so I have a couple more. I have uh, our final our final like uh, three questions here. This is it. The final the final stretch of. Uh, Final four, sorry, final four questions here. So these are just uh, miscellaneous survivor statistics, and uh, and uh, yeah, that's about it. So I don't think these have any even like super correlations. So the first question that David looked at was, uh, are previous votes against the player a prediction, uh, a predictor of that player being voted out? So you know, a player that's been voted out or had votes against them, is that person more likely to be voted out uh, later on in the game? My gut is yes, but uh, what do you think, Rob? Um, I think so. I mean, the, that the fact that people had votes uh, cast against them, I think that's probably a, a predictor that they will be voted out later in the game. Yeah, not not a good sign. You would think when people want to vote you out, regardless of the you know of the reason or anything, right? Although the one thing that makes me pause is that you know you could have a season where somebody is quite obviously running things, and people are trying to take lots of shots at them. Yeah. Right, and then if they successfully survive their vote, they're more likely to keep winning. So uh, we we looked at this, and we looked at it through a couple of like different ways, and we looked at the other things, tried to do a percentile to see a bunch of different things, and when we looked at it, it actually turns out that there isn't really an effect uh, on being voted in excuse me, being voted in the past and being voted out in the future. It doesn't seem like there is uh, much of an impact uh, between them, believe it or not. So uh, it, there's a slight indicator, but it's very tiny and not statistically relevant, actually. Okay. So there you go. There, there was one interesting thing, though, that, uh, that I thought was, was something that I would not have thought of, but uh, the eventual winners of every single season very, very rarely had more than just one vote cast against them prior to the merge. So if, you've, if, if a player is voted more than once prior to the merge, they are extremely unlikely to win the game. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I believe the player with the most votes against them that won the game, I believe this was the answer to Final Jeopardy when we did Survivor Jeopardy, nice. I believe is Aris. Uh, that could very well be possible. I actually don't have that on here. No, well, I, I, I don't expect you to, but I believe that that was the case. Yeah, I, I, I believe that. And I remember that season, he, he got voted for a ton. And obviously there are the Cochrans of the world who I don't think he ever got even a vote against him in the season he won, right? That happens a lot too. Right, so so there's that as well. The only players to have more than one vote cast against them pre-merge and still end up winning the game. Do you want to guess, or do you uh, do you think uh, uh, Chris? Yep, Chris and Venatu. He had three votes cast against him uh, uh, in the pre-game and survived. And uh, let me. I'm just trying to think real quick off the top of my head. There's only people. one more, and it was a girl, and she had two votes against her pre-merge. Uh, a woman. With uh, two votes cast against her pre-merge, uh, give me like five more seconds. And uh, Jenna Maraska. Uh, it's Parvati, apparently, in Micronesia. 
So she had two two votes against her there, unfortunately. Every other player, every single other player to win the game of Survivor had either zero or one vote cast against them prior to the merge. How it crazy makes sense. is that? It makes sense, though. It does make sense, but I would not have thought that would be such a clean break. Kind of, kind of yeah. weird. I think it's hard to you know have a really bad start and win the game. I think only a couple people have done that. Yeah, I mean, apparently, apparently, it's a very, very rare thing, and it makes sense. If the boat's already shaky in the beginning, it's going to be hard to make it all the way to the end. Uh, you know, I think that that definitely makes makes uh, a lot of sense there. Yeah, hard to get so, your everything straightened out. Yeah, uh, for for sure. I mean, it's hard to make new alliances. Like, you need those core alliances, I think, to take you to that to the stage where you can even like you know make those moves and try to try to win the game finally at the end anyway. So ironically, I feel like it happens uh, a bit more on Big Brother. Somebody has a rocky start to the game and is able to uh, right the ship and win the game. I would love to, I would love to because I'm not a, a Big Brother watcher, which is you know been very painful for me. I've been waiting for you to come back to the show. Usually, people I say the opposite. Really? I am a Big Brother watcher, and it is very painful to me. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'm looking forward to getting back to Survivor so I can regularly watch your content again because I don't watch Big Brother. I don't know what to say. Okay. I'm excited. I, I think you made a more productive use of your summer. <laughs> Maybe. Than, so, than podcasting 40 hours of Big Brother. Like I did. <laughs> maybe, maybe. So there is only two questions left that I really think are important that I want to get to. So the the first question is, does a player's age correlate with uh, how long that player survives in the game? I would have thought the answer is yes for sure. Once you hit a certain level, like 50 years old or older, you're less likely to win the game. That just seems like it makes sense to me. What, what do you think about that? That seems like it makes sense to me as well. We don't have a lot of old Survivor winners, so I feel like uh, there's a sweet spot, I feel like, but uh, I'm interested to know the findings. Yeah, well, we did a, we did a, uh, we used a, a type of a statistical research tool called the regression a analysis, and so we were able to kind of give points based on age and elimination rankings and things. And by we, I mean David, of course, because he's the laboratory wizard, you know. So, uh, so we basically were able to find out that there isn't really uh, data to show that age is, is a factor. Now, that only goes really from about, you know, 18 to, to the 60. Once you get once you get above that, then it's, we think that they're probably there's just not enough people. They would probably have a pretty big disadvantage. So instinctively, we think that that would be the case. But there's really not data that's to support that. Uh, you know, there the the sample size is is pretty small in the larger numbers because there haven't been too many players above. Uh, you know, even like 55 or 60 really, obviously throughout the course of the show. Bob Crowley. Uh, the oldest winner, I believe, at 57. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, but really, pretty much everybody else is on equal footing. Okay. The more you know. Makes sense. Yeah, apparently not a, not a huge uh, disadvantage there. Very last, the very last question on this statistic journey that we've been on here together, the, the very last one. Is the player who wins the game more likely to come from the first tribe to get fire? I thought that was an interesting question. That's an interesting question. I have to. I would have to say no. I, I wouldn't think that there's a big correlation between first to get fire and first to win the game because typically there's not a big discrepancy between when one tribe gets the other one does. Like maybe it's a day or two, but sure. I think that that's all going to balance balance out. Well, what did you guys find? Well, we looked at every single season, and uh, it turned out that. Uh, you would you would assume that uh, that you would assume that 14 of 28 players would come from the first tribe to get fire based on random chance. You'd assume it'd be exactly half, and as it turns out, uh, only 13 of the 28 tri uh, winners started the, started the game in a tribe that got fire first. So there's really no evidence to suggest that uh, having access to fire first is a indicator towards you winning the game or not. So yeah, you're right. Pretty much uh, yeah. not a factor at all. Yeah. There you um, go. I also, uh, like, I feel like uh, one other thing that, uh, you know, if we ever did a follow-up on this, uh, just one, one of the things I think would be interesting to see is, uh, does the number of tribal councils you attend before the merge, uh, what, how does that impact your game after the merge? Like, does, yeah. like is there something to being battle-tested early on in the game, and does that help you uh, strategically in, you know, uh, your game after the merge. 
Sure, of course. I mean, I think that's a great question. There were a couple other ones earlier today, and I think uh, everybody that watched this, if you enjoyed this and you have more questions and you want to just know more, you shoot us uh, tweets and uh, comments and things like that because I would love to, to, to give you know more data to David and say, hey, you go research these 15 things and we'll do a, a follow-up podcast in three months or whatever. I'd love to do that. So fire questions and tweets. You know, We'd uh, obviously love to, love to see them. Yeah, well, definitely send us tweets if you enjoyed this and use the hashtag wrap it up that That's Jason right. has uh, so uh, nicely put up behind behind him on that fancy board, right? That's right. That, that lights up. That's and right. then also, I would say put your f other questions in the comment section because that's going to be probably the best way to collect them because, you know, after a day goes by, it's impossible to find tweets from the past. Of course. So let's put them in the comments uh, on robiswebsite.com just to uh, sort of collect them. And we're going to post all of it, all this data. You know, I'm a big open source man of the people. So we're going to post this whole document and all this data. You guys can read it all through and see how exactly David built all these things and what he did with all that stuff. I'm going to tweet it. Rob, I'm thinking you're going to post it. It'll be in the comments below yep. so you guys can check it all out and make your own survivor handbook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like the, the Survivor Handbook is also good for getting a fire started on Survivor. It would be very, it'd be very <laughs> helpful. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Also, it could stop some bullets. You know, if you're needing to stop musket bullets, or a whole bunch of things, ready to go. Useful yeah, fantastic. Um, this is great. Jason, well, thank, thank you so much. This was fantastic. I'm sure everybody's going to appreciate this. Uh, or almost 24 hours, or I'm sorry, almost 48 hours away from the Survivor premiere. What are you doing for the premiere? How, how are you going to celebrate the start of Survivor? I, I'm actually really excited. I I uh, I know vaguely who's on this season, but I haven't done like a like a deep looking into all of them. I like seeing the first episode, and then I go, okay, who are my favorites going to be? You know, etc. I go from there. But uh, this is actually the first season of Survivor that I've ever gambled on, so I'm very excited about that. Oh, I got some, whoa! I've got some wagers on the season of Survivor, so it's just like drafts and things, you know. So uh, we'll. We'll see. I'm going to have to do some research, I guess, and figure it out, and uh, yeah, we'll have to see. It always is more fun when you gamble, Rob. I, I yes. could watch snails race if I had a bet on one of the snails, you know, so it's whatever. Okay. Um, Jason, what's your ritual for Survivor? You watch it live, or you go you go play poker, and you're watching it at like 4 o'clock in the morning? Well, <laughs> well, you know, my, uh, my Survivor ritual for years was always the same, you know, watching it live, you know, then that's it. But now, ever since I've been introduced to you by a mutual fan of ours, now I try to, now I try, I have DirecTV, East Coast feed, try to watch then so I can then watch the recap so I'm not behind. Yeah, so now the ritual is uh, watch, watch with whoever is around and then obviously got to go to the... Me? That's pretty good. There you go. Can't beat that. That's right. All right. Well, all right. So follow Jason on Twitter. He is at Jason Somerville. He is. If you are a, a fan of of poker, and for some reason you are not already following uh, what this man is doing, then you need to have your head examined because uh, he's killing it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing new shows every single day, 10.30 in the morning. You can see how the set looks like when it's all lit up and exciting, and instead of saying wrap it up, it has the bankroll number. I'm trying to make some money over here, Rob. I'm trying to help the people learn how to make money and uh, have fun while doing it, too. So if you have been turned off in the past by those boring you know, poker videos, that's not how we do it over here. In case it's not obvious, that's not exactly how we do things. So check it out, runup.com. Uh, we do new videos every single day, every single day. All right, very, very fun. We are uh, getting all geared up for our uh, big Survivor kickoff uh, this Wednesday night. It's plus it's going to be the finale of Big Brother. Uh, our Big Brother finale coverage kicks off 11.15 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we're also going to have a Utopia podcast uh, between now and then. Are you watching the Utopia, Jason? I do not, do not know what that is, but no, you, I, I want you to know. I'm going to say it here publicly, but I want to know. I want to be on the bench. I want you to just. I want to get the phone call one day at like 7 p.m. and be like, "Wiggler's out for the night. We need you to do The Walking Dead." I'm. I'm ready. I'm ready. Right, I want it to happen. Yeah, you'll be like, yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, I've got like three hundred thousand dollars in front of me. I'm in a <laughs> tournament right now. Uh, Good. I'll, 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 leave, it back I'll leave it all. I, I just want to do a Walking <laughs> Dead podcast. Just one. I just want to do one. All That's right. It. Well, you'll be the you're the first off the. What if I can't make it? Would you do the podcast with Josh Wiggler on uh, Post Show Recap? Would be, 
I, I mean, honestly, that would be probably even better, honestly. But I didn't want to say that at first, you know. So. Okay. You got well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, all right. So we're just getting all set up here for another big season of Survivor Podcast. Uh, we're gonna do. Uh, uh, at least 40 or 50 hours of podcasting about this season on just Survivor alone on the 13 episodes of Survivor coming up. If you want to get on board and 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 experience it, the the full Robin's podcast experience and become a patron as well, uh, you could see more about that at robinswebsite.com slash patron. Going to be a, a crazy couple of months here with Survivor coming back. Can't wait. Going to be All fun. Right. All right. Thanks so much uh, as well to... Uh, to David for putting this all together. Please, uh, David, if you're watching, thank you so much, and please extend your uh, my thanks to David for putting this all together. Of course. I, 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 like I said to David, he did an amazing job, and uh, you guys have more, want to see more like this? You guys can be the puppeteer of, of David's work, so you can uh, give him some more stuff to do, and I'll happily write the check. It's a great deal, I think. So uh, let us know if you have more survivor questions, and we'll send David to work. Maybe we can do more, Rob. We can have him do Big Brother work. We can just have him do everything. We'll just conquer the TV world by a statistic storm. All right. So, sounds good. All right. Thanks so much, everybody, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Sounds good.